as far as the border issue is concerned i'm sorry to say but i do not see china taking a step forward and restoring the not even the status quo ante which we keep talking about but the original border that is not going to happen but i think we were very benign and very calm about this and taking it as a with a pinch of salt i think 2020 changed that and 2020 also the galwan incident which changed that and i think that was a message to the chinese that india is not going to take nonsense anymore and india as the leading maritime power in the indian ocean has to ensure and its own economic interests and its own maritime interests has to ensure that it never loses that advantage which it has in the indian ocean we need to build that capacity and that capability to not let go of that advantage that we have under any circumstances hello and welcome to the forum for global studies latest podcast today we have with us distinguished guest to speak on china india relations dear friends i am so glad to have india's top most expert on submarine and maritime we have with us commodore anil jay singh sir so you are most welcome to your gs thank you dr tripathi it's an honor to be on your program and uh, be a part of forum for global studies thank you so much for inviting me today it's my pleasure sir <clears throat> so dear friends uh, <clears throat> as we know that uh, uh, in china Uh, when we talk about the china lots of discussion lots of points lots of speculations uh, starts and uh, uh, in the month of july the two meetings india's foreign affairs minister uh, <clears throat> dr jay shankar it has two meeting with chinese counterpart the first meeting 4th july in astana in uh, seo and the ceo meeting was in there and the second meeting in uh, uh, 27 july uh, in uh, asia meeting so it will be important to know the dynamics of this meeting and which kind of impact is coming from this meeting especially uh, when we have a very touchy tension in china especially on the border issue so to know more about this meeting and to know more dynamics in terms of the defense perspective uh, today we will know the more insights from our guest uh, kamaro anil jay singh sir so uh, how do you see this visit because uh, we have seen the tension that has that is started uh, on was 20 uh, may 2020 the galwan crisis and uh, then after that uh, we have also seen the december 2022 So lots of you know tussles and lots of crises are going on in terms of the uh, near the border. So how do you see? Is there any uh, hope? Is there any possibility of cooperation and to diffuse this tension? I think this is classic Chinese uh, uh, tactic of keeping India under pressure. Uh, as a result of what happened in Galwan and that entire uh, tension along the line of actual control. has kept us now on our toes 24/7 365 days of the year in the pre prior to that in the winters we used to withdraw and so we didn't have to there was not so much uh, logistic pressure in order to maintain the army there now that has increased so to that extent china has succeeded in put keeping us under pressure by occupying i think a more advantageous position they have the advantage of terrain because for them it's a plateau for us it's mountainous ranges to reach uh, along the lac so from that perspective yes as far as the border issue is concerned i'm sorry to say but i do not see china taking a step forward and restoring the not even the status quo ante which we keep talking about but the original border that is not going to happen if it had to happen if china had any intention of doing that it would have happened by now what we have to be now very wary about is how much further does china want to encroach into indian territory or come across the lac whether you call it no man's land or buffer zone or whatever the fact is that they have this habit of inching in creeping forward waiting to see the reaction yeah. no reaction creep a little forward reaction go back they just wait to see how is the country reacting and india so far before 2020 was not reacting as i won't say aggressively but i think we were very benign and very calm about this and taking it as a with a pinch of salt i think 2020 changed that and 2020 also to the galwan incident which changed that and i think that was a message to the chinese that india is not going to take nonsense anymore 
from the point of view of discussing the border issue, I think it's a discussion that must continue till you don't have dialogue, you will never come to any solution, good or bad. We've had some 20 odd rounds of core commander talks. Nothing has come out of that. The little post here, little post there. I think India has to now understand that this is going to be the status quo, which it understands. And that is why we did a smart thing that certain places where they had moved in and were occupying, particularly along Pangong So and all that, we also went and occupied certain critical places. So it was became more of a us versus them kind of situation and not that they were putting pressure on us everywhere. If we could not remove them from where we wanted, we went and occupied some other position. That uh, put them under pressure. As far as their cartographic intentions go, I don't think they're going to change. That five fingers, famous five fingers of this are very much there. If you know they changed the maps. The maps changed, the standard map they changed last year. They made the nine dash line into ten dash line and they included a lot of Arunachal Pradesh into Chinese territory, saying it is part of southern Tibet, so it's part of China. Now, we, we protested, but a protest is not enough. So we protested, so what happened? Nothing, we protested. The long-term implication, okay, it's just a line on a map, so effectively nothing on ground has changed. But for future generations of Chinese, who will be taught in schools and brought up on the new map, they will be told from day one that India, see, this is our map, India is sitting in our territory. So every Chinese individual is going to grow up thinking that India has occupied Chinese territory. And that is the long-term implication and long-term intent of this. They want to change perceptions. They try and change the narrative, which we seem to lose out on. And frankly speaking, we should not trust China's efforts too much. We know what happened with Panshin in 62. Every possible map treaty that was ever decided over the last 100 years, China has disacknowledged it and said, that was British India which did it, or we were not part of it, or our representative have left before it was signed, so we don't recognize this. Where all these years we were under the impression that these are the existing arrangements, 1921, Simla, etc., etc. That is not the case actually. China doesn't recognize it. So I think uh, the stand that India has taken now with China, particularly you know with the diplomacy that India has shown in the last few years, has been I think more aggressive in the sense that. We have made our, our feelings known quite clearly to the Chinese. We refused to become a part of Belt and Road Initiative. We said these are part, these are because of sovereignty issues, not because we didn't want to be part of the economic, uh, Chinese economic stranglehold. So I think this is the right approach. We are willing to talk to you, but we will talk on our terms. We will not talk on your terms. That I think is a very positive thing and we must engage with them. I'm, we are a member of SCO. China only made us a member of SCO. It's a good thing. We should know what's happening there also. We are a part of BRICS. We have a Russia, India, China trilateral. So it's not that we are not engaging with them. But I think we should, we have to, we are and we should be realistic enough to know what will actually to expect on ground. That, that is, is important. That is India is engaging. Uh, at the same time, India is countering also. Correct. And I think engagement is very important. Dialogue must continue. Not having a dialogue means there will never be a solution. So that is important. But the dialogue is happening more on the way we would like to shape the dialogue and not be allowed ourselves to be shaped by the dialogue. This is as far as the LSE is concerned. But I think what, is, what will happen in the maritime sphere is far more important than what is happening along the border. So that we have to watch, wait and watch very carefully over the next 7 to 10 years. Uh, the things are going to actually play out in the maritime domain because economically that is what is going to count. The border is a border. Every country's border is inviolate. Nobody else can come and come across your border. Territorial integrity is absolutely important and sacrosanct. That we have to maintain. But for our own economic security interests, it is the Indian Ocean that we have to really focus on in the next few years because that is what China is doing. How is India responding in terms of the maritime security? Well, let me first give you the Chinese perspective. China is at the moment has the largest navy in the world. They have more than 350 ships. Even the Americans don't have 300 ships. So on paper, it is the largest navy in the world. It has the largest merchant fleet in the world. It has the largest shipbuilding uh, capacity in the world. It has the largest coast guard in the world. It has the largest fishing fleet in the world. So in all respects, it is the largest in the maritime domain. So it is now an established maritime power. India is still not a maritime power. We are a naval power. Maritime power takes into account your complete maritime ecosystem. We are trying to address that. We have programs like Project Sagar Mala is going on. Yes. We have just commissioned a port called Vizinjum, first deep water port for transshipment purposes. Otherwise, so far, India did not have a deep water port. So Indian cargo used to go to Dubai, Singapore or Colombo. 
from where it used to be transshipped to other ships and they used to bring it to India. Okay. We have now got our own. And this is important not only from our perspective, if it becomes a transshipment port for foreign cargoes also, going to other countries, then we have some control over those shipping lanes because they come into our ports. Okay. China, on the other hand, is doing exactly the same thing. Through its Belt and Road Initiative, it has made these port projects in very strategic areas. Mm -hmm. You know, if you remember, there used to be something called a string of pearls. Yes. So this is an extended string of pearls, right from Ch the Chinese mainland, right up to Europe. Intention being that once they have a foothold in each of these ports, which they've chosen, these strategic ports, they will control the shipping that comes there. And so they will control the shipping lanes. And so they will then be able to change the rules-based order in the Indian Ocean into one which suits their requirements and not the present one which suits Western requirements. So effectively, what it will do, it will compromise what we call now a free and open Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific will not remain free and open. So that is something we have to guard against. Now, China's 350 ship Navy is at the moment does not have the power projection capability to establish itself in an ocean away from its own waters. So it will come to Indian Ocean. There are always six to eight to ten much Chinese naval ships operating in the Indian Ocean, anti-piracy patrols, etc., etc. But they are not a threat to India yet. And that is why, if you notice, it's been four years since the standoff along the LAC, but the Chinese Navy has never come into an encounter with the Indian Navy. They have stayed clear of the Indian Navy because China is fully aware of its vulnerability. That is number one. This China is trying to change. By 2030, they intend to have a 450, 430 ship navy, but with a lot of blue water capability. They have already established a base in Djibouti. They have more or less, the Godar port of Pakistan is more or less their base. Yes. They are helping Chittagong develop a port. They have built a submarine base for the Bangladesh Navy off, Chitt off Cox's Bazar. They already have a stronghold foothold in Myanmar. So now they have access to Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea, which is part of their, their strategy to contain India. The Indian Ocean is very important to China because China's own maritime geography is so unfavorable for it to project power abroad because it has the first island chain, it has the second island chain, it has narrow waters, it can be contained over there. It needs sea space. Indian Ocean provided the sea space to establish its maritime dominance. And more importantly, the Indian Ocean gives it access to the Atlantic Ocean, which is where it has to be if it has to become a dominant global maritime power and challenge the Americans. So that is a very important aspect of it. And then, of course, there is the famous Chinese Malacca dilemma. They are scared that we can choke, choke them economically. So they will always have a strong naval presence to ensure that we can't choke them. So I think these are very, in, in, very briefly, these are the maritime dimension that India must worry about. And India, as the leading maritime power in the Indian Ocean, has to ensure, and its own economic interests, and its own maritime interests, yes. has to ensure that it never loses that advantage which it has in the Indian Ocean. We need to build that capacity and that capability to not let go of that advantage that we have under any circumstances. So that is important from the maritime perspective. Great, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your uh, valuable insights on the Indian Ocean and India's maritime security and the kind of threat that we can observe from the Chinese side and that India it has to be prepared to retaliate any kind of threat in the Indian Ocean. Thank you so much, sir. Your insights are very valuable time. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Tripathi. That was very nice. Thank you.